Run it up, then run it back. Yeah. Run it up, then run it back. Run it back. Run it up, then run it back. Yeah. Run it up. Oh, back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like it's getting to us. Good Tuesday morning and welcome to Run It Back. Um, we want to send a special shout out to our viewers in Sacramento. Welcome and good morning on the West Coast. Sean <laughs> Charania coming to us from Chicago. Chandler Parsons from the Los Angeles area. I can tell by the art behind you, you're back at home. And Lou from the ATL. Guys, uh, we are going to start today with uh, uh, just a, an upset of a game for a variety of reasons that occurred last night. But my goodness, the 11-3 and three Celtics falling to the four and nine Hornets. Uh, yeah, 121, 118 in overtime. LaMelo Ball had 36. He forced overtime with the tough bucket. Miles Bridges, hey. um, who should not be playing in the league, 14 points, 15 rebounds, including the game winning three in overtime. And Jason Tatum, by the way, despite the season high 45, 13 and six, <clears throat> fouled on a three, made his first two, missed the last. That would have tied it. Um, this is an ugly, ugly loss to what was a three and nine team, Chandler. How bad is it? I mean, it's bad. It's ugly, and they had their chances to win, but nights like this happen in a long NBA season, and like I said, they had their chances. They had no Derek White. They had no Al Horford. Uh, you know, Tatum makes their free throw. Who knows what happens in, in you know, in overtime, but uh, this is bad, but as a team with the with the Celtics, the trajectory they're on, the, the season that they're going to have, this is one you, you might not even watch film on this until you play them again. You... <laughs> You flush it, you move on, you you know you can be better. You know with a, with a loss like this, a lot of it has to do with just effort and energy. Um, so it's bad. It's maybe they look back on it and just look at it like we let one go. But again, it's so early and, and the team is, the league is so talented now. There's going to be multiple nights like this where this does happen, where a, a bad team beats a good team. That's just how it goes. It's how talented the league is. But I don't think it's anything to panic at. Jalen Brown struggled. He was very inefficient. And again, they missed two role players that are very important on an already not so deep team. So I, I don't really look into it. Just chalk it up as a bad loss. Yeah, the depth thing I, I think will be a topic that comes up over and over again. Another topic that seems to come up where Jason Tatum is concerned is the the late game performances, I suppose. I mean, people that don't like him are going to talk about how he just can't come through in the clutch. And this was one of those moments where if he would have made that third uh, free throw, they would have they would have gone into it. So, Lou, talk to me. You love Jason Tatum. What is it about these last minute moments for him? Just think he's also also a slow start and finishing games. You know, this is the same player that was 50 percent on go ahead or tying shots um, on last season under 24 seconds in games. And so this is somebody that the Boston Celtics are comfortable putting the ball in his hands to go out and win basketball games. Hadn't been his, hadn't been his, uh, his strong suit this season, but I believe in him. I believe in him for the rest of the season. And look, these scenarios are going to come up time and time again throughout the course of this season, and they're still going to put the basketball in his hands. So I don't think it's a big deal. Yeah, and this is, listen, this, maybe it's a bigger deal now because of his struggles in the postseason. But again, we're talking about it's the Charlotte Hornets in November where this happened to uh, this happens to everybody. Jokic earlier this season missed a big free throw that ended up in a loss. It's going to happen. Uh, he's their best player on their team. He's going to be in the MVP hunt. He's first team all NBA. Uh, and by the way, he had an unbelievable game. So it's, it's of yeah. course, you want to have that free throw back and send this game to overtime and get a win. But uh, this isn't something that I'm worried about. I'm more worried about, you know, Jalen Brown going five to 17 uh, too many times, but no, this this is nothing to me. Uh, so we got to talk about the elephant in the room here, Chandler. Miles Bridges um, recently returned from a 30-game domestic <laughs> violence suspension. Still has ongoing legal issues at the moment. Um, last night he hits the game-winning three. Two seasons ago he was averaging 20. Uh, what does his presence do for this Hornets team as far as, you know, in-season tournament or at the end of the season? Do they have a shot with him on this roster? No, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, they're going to win some games. And look, it, Miles Bridges is a talented basketball player. There's no doubt about it. He's got the potential to be a very good basketball player. But for me, it's the issues off the court where I don't even know how he's playing. Uh, the, the, the things he's done to women uh, with children involved, uh, honestly, I don't know every detail, so I don't want to get into it too much. But to have that happen... I got no respect for this dude. I don't even know how he's playing right now. I think the NBA honestly dropped the ball, letting him come back soon. Um, it's just disappointing because there's no room for that. As a father, a new father to a daughter, I don't know what I would do if that was my daughter they did that too. So 
I, I, I don't I, I don't really want to talk about him, but the team is young and they do have some talent there, but I think they're still a ways away. Yeah, I'm with you on this one, Chandler. You, you cannot convince me that there are not hundreds, if not thousands of dudes who are as equally talented that would be willing and able and thirsty and hungry to take the spot of Miles Bridges. I'm a little bit, actually, no, I'm a lot disappointed in the league for dropping the ball on this one. But the outlook for him moving forward, Shams, is what? Yeah, I think on the court, the Hornets obviously feel if he's in the lineup, they, they have a much better chance of competing. This is a team that wants to play in the, in the playing tournament. They want to play in the playoffs. They've had a couple blowout losses in playing tournament games the last couple of years. So they want to take that step um, and, and really have him in, in the lineup. And there's no question. There, there's teams monitoring Miles Bridges off the court, on the court. Definitely a two-way wing, like you said, Michelle. I mean, a couple of years ago, average 20 at the game winner last night, 14, 15, and five assists last night. He was in line for $100 million before <laughs> everything off the court uh, led into essentially him taking a $7.9 million qualifying offer, betting on himself this year. And if he's healthy, if he's clean off the court, obviously he has some, some, some things in February. He's, there's a legal matter that still needs to play out. Um, so really, he needs to figure that aspect out. But there are definitely teams monitoring him and seeing how he plays. And he's going to be an unrestricted free agent in the summer. This is the crappy part of sports where you get forced to have to talk about dudes like this. It's my least favorite part of the job, um, and I hate when it rears its ugly head. But luckily, we're done. We're done. We can move on because there's a guy on the team that I would think you want to build around in LaMelo Ball. His sixth 30-point game in the last eight games. He's fun to watch. Uh, Lou, is this the dude you build a team around? Absolutely. If you're the Charlotte Hornets, I think you kind of take a page out of the, out of the Houston Rockets uh, notebook. Go get some vets to build around him, some young talent, um, and see what can happen out of, out, of, out of Charlotte. You know, he's one of those guys, you know, he's, last six out of eight games, he's had 30-point performances. But I think he's trying to do, he's, he's having to do too much to carry this team to victories over and over again. They got to get some more talent around this guy, but definitely a young cornerstone point guard for the future. Yeah, he also gave us our uh, our first That Man Has a Family moment for the show today. There's a moment here <laughs> with Drew Holiday. It's just, it's not the best. Uh, you're not going to want it on your resume tape if you're uh, if you're Drew. But here we go. Re <laughs> reactions. Uh, hey, <laughs> there's man, breaking the golf and there's breaking the best defending <laughs> guard. On. Hey, it's like, being a, pretty it's like being a shot blocker, man. When you got to guard the best players, things are going to happen from time to time. Yeah. So. Man. You know what I like LaMelo Ball? LaMelo Ball, he's just a, he looks like a kid that's just hooping at the park. I feel like this is exactly yeah. how he would play yeah. in LA Fitness. He has fun. <laughs> he's exciting to watch. As, as kind of shitty as this organization's been, this kid is a bright spot, and at least he gives these fans a show every single night. He And... He's a lot taller than you think. I saw the dude in LA. He is a legit six seven point guard. Like he he is a rare, rare special talent. He's just not getting as much attention as the other guys because he's kind of stuck in Charlotte. I also like when you go to games and you're in the where the guys park their cars, his car collection oh, yeah. is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's just crazy, and I enjoy it every time. Uh, moving on to another game that happened. This one was weird. Nuggets, Pistons, um, <laughs> with some weird ejections in this one. Yeah, they defeat the Pistons 107-103, but Jokic gets ejected with two techs. He played only 15 minutes. Um, Coach got ejected at some point. Reggie Jackson, KCP, 20.6 assists. Reggie had 21. Kate Cunningham who has told us now the team is bad, 27 points, 9 assists. But the two techs, after playing only 15 minutes, uh, even the Pistons play-by-play -play dude had some words for the refs that they're doing too much and that no one paid to come see the refs, Chandler. What, it, this is, I feel like we've had a lot of these in the very early part of this season. Yeah, it's, it's been rough. And, and I will say, as a player, there's nothing more frustrating, especially when you have your own struggles or you can't put the ball in the in, in the hoop, and then all of a sudden you're in foul trouble over tic tac calls, or you know, and then the rotation changes. I, I will say it's it's I've said multiple times, being a ref is the worst job in the world. No matter what <laughs> happens, every time you blow that whistle, someone's pissed at you, right? Like you you can't get it right with everybody. I will say this, Jokic one, he he definitely was fouled, and there was definitely contact. Again, these refs humans, they're not trying to miss these calls. 
But this to me, this looked like a, this was premeditated to me. He had already had a tech. He knew he was going to get tossed in this game. I got to imagine if it was a more competitive team, the Pistons, he doesn't do this because he knows that they need him to win this game. So I think this was a, a, you know, a premeditated move here. But yeah, I mean, listen, it's frustrating. As a competitor, you want to win. And when you feel like you're not getting a, you know, an even draw here with the whistle, it pisses you off, man. But as a retired, more mature guy now, Michelle. Yes, of I course. See there, being a ref's hard. I mean, Richard Jefferson did it last year. He was like, I will never do that again, dude. It sucks. <laughs> like, you're not going to see everything. Oh, I don't I don't even know how they see half of what they do see. Look, maybe yeah. maybe this was Jokic's way of sort of forcing the other guys on the team to bond and play, Lou, because they got the win without him, and obviously they still don't have Jamal Murray back. Is there a confidence build in this for the for the rest of the guys? Not for this particular game. <laughs> not <laughs> not not for this particular game. You know, I, I felt like they thought they could win this basketball game without their star players. They went out, out and did it. Jokic went to the showers early. And they pulled out a they pulled out a win in Detroit, and so I thought that was a game they probably felt like they could win anyways. You know, Detroit is starting to grumble a little bit about how the season is going. Denver is still on the trajectory of trying to compete for another championship, so I definitely felt like they could win this game without, without their guys. I don't think they take much from this. I'll say this: it takes it takes a certain type. Like, Lou, did you get a lot of texts in your career? I did not. I didn't play with my yeah, Mike. Like, dude, like Mike Conley, I don't think he's ever been teed up in his career. And it's just, I don't know how you guys do it because in the heat of the moment, it is, it's easy to lose control. How do you it's do it? Play. I mean, I, I like, it's, really? It's wordplay. You just, you just got to find a way how to, how to say what you want to say. Even sometimes when I went overboard, I developed relationships with the referees that was cool enough that they can kind of take what I had to say. So you would say stuff. You just knew where the line. Oh, I, I had a, I had a lot to say, but I, yeah. knew, I, I knew when to pull back. I will delivery. say there are certain refs that you can, like Tony Brothers, the Zach Zarba. These are refs that you can have that banter with, where they can get a little more. They'll talk shit back to you. Like remember last year, Tony, <laughs> right. remember Tony Brothers talk shit back to Spencer Dinwiddie or something. So the, I like. I think there should be that banter. But then there's there's these whole new waves. I'm watching games this year. There's like six to eight refs I've never even seen before. So I, you yeah, know, same. Different. Yeah, there's some some right. newbies out there. Um, Shams, we got to know Jamal Murray. Like, what are we thinking here? How much longer do we know anything about when he could possibly return? Yeah, ha hamstrings are tough. You can't rush a hamstring. But the the Nuggets are finishing up a road trip right now. They they play their final game of this road trip on Friday in Houston. I think they're looking at next week as a possible window. As we get closer to December, December 1, they play in Phoenix. So that's that's around the range into December, possibly closer to December is when you're looking at. But this is two totally different teams with Jamal Murray and without. Of course, he's he's a superstar player, especially come playoff time. Six and one with him in the lineup. Everyone, Everywhere across the board, they're, they're better from points to their, to their ratings, to their field goal, three-point percentage. Without him in the lineup, they're four, four and three. Uh, they just don't generate offense as much. Nikola Jokic has the ball in his hands, obviously a lot anyway, 30% usage rating. It jumps to about 35 without Jamal Murray. So they need him back in the lineup. They want him back in the lineup, but they also can't rush it. The We sort of touched on the Cade Cunningham of it all, but he, he did have a quote recently. Uh, here it is. It's hard to just like be, we're good, we're good. You know what I'm saying? Because we're bad. We have to address that. Do you really want your star player saying the team is bad? bad is my question to you Chandler although one could say honesty is the lovely thing I mean if you play 15 games and you lose 13 of them you, you so he's 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 speaking facts and for him it's tough he probably sees all these other teams that are just as young if not younger and have this crazy ceiling and potential and future and the Pistons have been bad for quite a while now and it's got to be frustrating because he is a very good player he gets drafted this is a team where like the city is not one of the best so they're gonna have to uh, they're gonna have to acquire guys via trade the draft and they haven't been able to do that it's not like this is going to be a destination where you know the people are going to be chomping at the bit to come and play there so this is a real struggle and i mean again they're two and 13 at some point these guys they look in the mirror they can have all the coaches meetings player meetings all they want Let's call a spade a spade. There's some guys on this NBA roster that aren't NBA players. It's it's not a good situation. They're not a good team. 
uh, and they're not going to be good. It's not like this is a remedy where they're going to figure it out. So I feel his pain. Obviously, you don't ever want to, you know, do this this early. You don't want to come at your teammates. This is also this is something maybe he could have just said in the locker room and not to the <laughs> media. Uh, but he's probably at it. He's probably you know had enough and maybe this is a way for him to spark his guys he's no doubt the best player on this team the leader of this team at such a young age so i don't think this is the way to handle it but they're bad i like Chandler it Lou, have you guys been to detroit <laughs> oh no don't do this shams don't Listen, do this hey, I'm hey I'm sir the pot no, ask me I'm just I'm asking. Not Detroit. I got a lot of. Have you ever friends. lived in Detroit? Let's do it again. Let's just. I'm go. not this in Detroit. <laughs> <Don't> do it. <laughs> hey, but you know what? You know what, Chandler? I I actually like the position that he's taking. This is one thing people got to understand. His face is on this. His his name, his face, his reputation is on everything the Detroit Pistons do, and so he wants to hold these guys accountable. He wants to hold himself accountable to be better. Because at the end of the day, we're not going to remember a lot of guys' name on that team. It's going to be Kay Cunningham's fault if they don't start having success really, really fast. And so I like the position that he's taking. He's trying to hold his teammates accountable. He wants the city of Detroit to know that we want to do better. I want to be better. He's taking that leadership role on. And so I have no problem with him saying this out loud. Just play better if you don't want to hear it. And again, he's saying he's saying we're bad. Our team yeah. is bad. Not singling anybody out, so I don't really see an issue with it either. No, I, I kind of like. What, I mean, also, what are you supposed to say? You're asked the same questions after every single game. At some point, you're just like, "We're bad." But I did. Chandler brought up a point. Shams, there are all these other young teams, the Oklahoma Cities, the Houston's. They are young, but they're also fun to watch, and we're talking about them in a positive way. So, what do you see the tra trajectory of this Pistons team as? Yeah, I think they were definitely trying to make the playoffs this year. That was a goal for them. And you have a good young core there. Cade Cunningham, Jalen Duran, Isaiah Stewart, Assert Thompson. This is a team in Detroit. I think you're starting to see the makings of young talent. But even in OKC, it took a few years to get to that point. And OKC had Shea Gillis Alexander, who took that next step in his career. Pistons are waiting for that guy, that second guy. Cade Cunningham obviously looks like he's the guy that can do it. But there's no question. There were playoff expectations this year. We'll see how the year plays out. It's still somewhat early, but this is a team, Detroit, that is struggling. They've been through a lot of injuries. Having Boyan Bogdanovich and Monte Morris, they're two vets. This is a team that, that needs veteran players to play for them on the court so they can be leaders off the court. But those two guys have yet to play this season, so they're still waiting their, their debuts. But, guys, they signed Monte Williams to a six-year Hundred million to up to a hundred million dollar contract as head coach. They're not doing that for him to just play and coach a team that is going to win and compete for 20, 25 games. Uh, they have aspirations, and it might not start this year, but eventually the clock is going to start in Detroit. It's all about the process and the long term, and I'm saying that because I'm segueing into the next game involving a team in a similar position. And don't look now, but we got a streak, y'all. The Clippers, woo, on a roll. Uh, beat the Spurs last night, 124-99. Paul George had 28 six assists. Kawhi finished with 21 points. James Harden, 10 assists, zero turnovers. And if you're keeping track of the big guy, Victor Wimanyama, he had nine points, two blocks. Look, the Clippers are 2-0 and oh since Russ is coming off the bench, Shams. Tell us truthfully, behind the scenes, how did this come about? Uh, this came about because the Clippers understood what we've been discussing for the last few weeks, which is that they needed to rip the Band-Aid off. Whether it was going to be James Harden, Russell Westbrook, whoever it was going to be, they needed to figure out a way to go in one direction. And, and obviously, James Harden being the guy that you're paying $36 million to, you just traded two first-round picks, two second-round picks, a draft swap, like three, four players on your roster to go get James Harden. This is a guy that led the league in assists last year. This is a guy that you can trust with the ball in his hands, you, 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 you've seen what he can do as the lead guard on your team. They've been searching for a lead guard for years. So they went all in on James Harden, and obviously the results are they were 0-5 when they started those two. Now they're 2-0 uh, with James Harden as their starting point guard. And so um, I, I think this makes James Harden the focal point. Uh, this puts the ball in his hands more, allows him to make decisions. And we're seeing the Clippers, are, at least the last couple of games, their offense has been a lot better James Harden's playing a lot better. He's playing a lot smoother with the ball in his hand. So this was really just about the Clippers doubling down on the trade and finally ripping that Band-Aid off. 
I know we sort of guessed and surmised and wondered what was going to happen, Lou, and you were adamant in saying Russ should not come off of the bench. Um, but here we are. And look, they're playing a, a pretty bad Spurs team, and they're playing them again tomorrow. It's hard to gauge that. But You said a bad Spurs team? I, I, I did. respect I your it. honesty about your I group. Said, I, I like that. <laughs> I said, I said I it. I like that. What, what am I going to do? Um, how are you feeling about this move? It's a great spin job. Uh, that's what I, that's what I say. It's a great spin job. It was reported that Russell Westbrook requested to come off of the bench, and so this makes him look like the hero. This makes him look like a team guy, which he is. And from everything that I've ever heard from former teammates of his, he's one of the best teammates that you can have. And so, for him taking the initiative and saying, "Look, I'll do it. I'll be the guy," and it's worked, you know, from that point. So, from the standpoint of being a great teammate, from the standpoint of who I've heard about Russell Westbrook is as a teammate. This is great for him to do, and it's worked so far. Yeah, I, to touch on what Lou said, this happened to be in Memphis where everything was going wrong. We were on a losing streak. I wasn't playing great. I was on a big contract, and the coaching staff pulled me in the office and said, I think I think we got to make a change, and everyone knew that I should start coming off the bench, right? But we're going to say to the media that this is your idea. So at the same time, it needs to happen but it's going to make me look like a team player, selfless, and a great guy. Not saying that happened here with Russ, but that definitely has happened before because it's happened to me, and it was the right thing to do. The, the whole America was talking about that someone's got to come off the bench and it's probably going to be Russ. So this is a way to kind of soften the blow to do it while making him look good, and a change needed to happen anyway. So I think it's great for their team. I think once Terrence Mann gets back to playing how he was playing last year, they're the deepest team in the NBA. And again, they have so much talent. They weren't going to keep losing every single game. And we were talking about it last week. As soon as they win one, two, three games in a row, we're not going to talk about that losing streak anymore. So I think it was the right timing. I think it was the right thing to do to make everybody involved look good. Whether that was Russ, he's a lot better man than I was if he actually went to the coaching staff and said that. But Teams do do that, and teams do, uh, teams are aware. So I think it was the right thing to do, and I think they're going to be a lot better for it. I think this is where you kind of see them take off and get to that next level. Okay, I have to I have to ask one follow up question, Chandler, because I you know I feel like I've gotten to know you a little bit over the course of the last season and whatever some change. If media comes up to you after this narrative has been thrown out there that you requested that you come off the bench for the betterment of the team, and then they ask you about that, do you just lie and say, "Yep, that was my idea. Thought it was a good one." Yeah, I think you say I have a dialogue with the coaching staff or front office and we both, you know, we both realize that this was the best situation for this season. And hmm. yeah, this is what they put out there. So now, yeah, he's 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 going to say that he's going to touch on that. But yeah, you can't go back. And, and if now if he says he did not now, there's a whole other story. Right. And now right. it's like he's in the front office under the bus and there's even more drama, uh, you know, than there was before. So, yeah, I think this is the plan in place and you stick to it. Ah, it's tough. It's tough. All right. Ty Lu recently said, this is my toughest challenge as a head coach, but I'm up for the task for sure. Chandler, do you agree? This is his toughest challenge. No, I think this is, I think this is one of his best teams. I think this is the deepest team. I think managing the, the individual guys and having to be the head coach and make the decision like this to bring a, you know, a hall of fame player off the bench. I think that is tough. But nah, give me this job all year long with this much talent, <laughs> this much depth, a new arena coming, living in L.A. I think this is the greatest opportunity in the NBA. I'm going to disagree with you, Chandler. And, 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 I, and I say that because I've been a part of this with Tilo. He needs a big win. And when I say a big win, they need to win a playoff series. They need to go deep in the playoffs. They have to make this team make sense very, very soon. And he's been at the helm you know, going on what I want to say four or five years now, and they hadn't got that that marquee win, including the groups that I've played on. We hadn't gotten over that hump for him to really feel comfortable in knowing he's the coach of the future for this team and how th these things are going. And so for me, I want to see T. Lou get a really big win with this group, and it's going to have its challenges. And so, like you said, new arena coming. You have a ton of talent, but they got to start making it make sense very, very soon. That makes sense to me. Um... Let's look at the team and the makeup of it. Paul George right now leading the Clippers in scoring. We always want to put labels. Lou, is he their best player? At this moment. And I think that's one of the that's one of the pluses for this basketball team. It's got, it can be a different guy every month. This month, I thought Paul, 
out of the four superstars that's on that team, I thought Paul just went out and just tried to be himself. He didn't really worry about who was on the team, who was on the floor. He just went out and did the things that he's always done um, to be one of the marquee basketball players in this league. And so this month, so far, he has been the best player. Who's, who knows who's, gonna, who's that going to be moving forward for this basketball team? But at this moment, I would say yes. Yeah, that's that's the luxury. That's the luxury they have, right? They, they they have a different guy every single night. Last night it was Paul George. Next game it could be James Harden. Then then all of a sudden Russ has a thirty point triple double off the bench. That is the luxury, which is why I don't think it's that tough of a gig. Obviously, there's expectations with great players and with all the you know the media and everything in Los Angeles that he's under a magnifying glass, but. To me, this is Monty Williams' biggest challenge, making that much money with that team and that roster. I think that's a way bigger challenge than having this much, this stacked of a team in a wide open league. But back to, to Paul George, yeah, he's going to be the best player, Kawhi Leonard. It's a great problem to have because they have so many guys that they can go get a bucket and that can be a closer at the end of the game. But it's going to be different every single night for this team. Yeah, on paper, it seems like it should be easy, but mm, what do I know? A uh, quick break time when we come back. Sham Scoops and the latest edition of Say What. Oh, it is that time, Shams. Look, the Grizzlies, no secret here, they are struggling. And then Marcus Smart gets hurt last week. They did not need that. Uh, what is the latest with him? Three to five weeks for Marcus Smart. He's going to miss time. He's got a foot injury. And so this is a Memphis team, 3-10, and 10, ravaged with injuries all year. John Morant, we know about the 25-game suspension. They're going to be out uh, without him through most of December. And then you have Steven Adams out for the season. Brandon Clark's going to miss a majority of the season with an Achilles tear. And then you have small injuries like Luke Kennard, two weeks sideline. You have Xavier Tillman now is week to week. And now Marcus Smart... This is a guy that they traded for. He's their starting point guard in the absence of John Moran. He was going to start next to John Moran when, when Jaws back in the lineup. But now Smart is out for at least the next month or so. And so, I, you know, for, for the Grizzlies, it's going to be hard staying afloat in this stacked Western Conference. Um, and and I, I'm just curious from a player perspective how demoralizing this is, <laughs> injury after injury and setback after setback. Yeah, Chandler, talk about that. How, how demoralizing is this? And also, without Jaw and you're three and 10, the, the concern was the hole would get too deep, then you can't get out of it. Why? Yeah, why I you? Mean, it's, uh, it's brutal for sure. And this is, this is a team that would have had very high expectations with job. But if you look, I mean, the Lakers, they're eight and six. The, the, what? The, so the Grizzlies are four, five games behind getting into the playoffs and I ain't having to play in the play in. So it is still there for them. I mean, again, what Shams just said with missing job for pretty much a whole nother month, it's, I can't imagine it gets better anytime soon, but this is a team without him that needs everybody. They don't have Steven Adams. They don't have Brandon Clark. Now they don't have Marcus Smart. I don't see it getting better this month. So that hole is going to get dug a little bit deeper. Um, but I mean, listen, there's only, they only got to beat out five other teams to get to the play in. And then they're fully loaded with John Morant. They're still, I'm not counting them out just yet. All right. It cooked. <laughs> <laughs> really? It's it? Yeah, it's bad. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I just wrote it down. I'm sitting here looking. You got OKC, you got the Clips, you got the Lakers, you got the Suns, you got Denver, you got Dallas. Those are teams that are in the Western Conference. So that's another 25, 30 games on your schedule that you got to see these six particular teams. And without your star player out, like you just said, at least for another month, Marcus Smart just going out for a month or so. This is going to be tough for this team to right this ship. I think they're I think they're in bad shape. They're cursed. This is a this is a disaster, Shams. We appreciate you. We thank you, and we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> We're going to stick around because right now it's time for say what. Is there anyone in this league you wouldn't try and dunk on? I wouldn't try and dunk on. Nah, if I if I see you in the way, I'm, I'm gonna try and dunk regardless. So. You're going to try Wemby next month? Wemby? Yeah. Next month? We play him next month? Twice, back to back. It's Christmas Day, right? Or Christmas Day. Like, like, like that Christmas, week. I think. No. 20, 29. Yeah, I mean, if he's there, then I'll try. But he was 7'1", 7'2". 7'4". He's serious? Yeah. 7'5". <laughs> <Seven, five inches. laughs> yeah, that's so deep. I mean, I mean if, if I get the chance, I'll try. <laughs> Are 
Are you serious? Okay, I don't. I, I, Lou, I like it. To try. I kind of love it too, but I, I like your, it. Is this a good yeah. idea, dunking on Wimby? Absolutely, no fear, <laughs> no no fear whatsoever. I, I salute the the young guy for having the confidence to say I'm gonna go out and try him. Until Wimby Wimby established himself as a legit <laughs> rim protector. Due to his height alone, he's going to get tried at the rim every single time, especially by the guys that can fly. So I like I like this take from him. I try him every time. Two things to me are really funny about this. Number one is that he thought they had a Christmas Day game, which. <laughs> <laughs> Aw, buddy. That's, that's buddy. insane. <laughs> I'm not doing this, man. I'm not doing this, man. <laughs> I love it because he genuinely like this wasn't an act. This was him. No. He had no clue of the schedule. He had no clue how tall this man was. He, which again, I love that. And this kid is bouncy. It goes back from last year where I love that he didn't make the rookie sophomore game, so he bailed out of the dunk contest. Mm. This guy will dunk on Wimby at some point. He is that bouncy. Uh, but I just loved how clueless this kid was. It was so good. I, I like serious? the fact it was 7-2, and then it went from 7-2 to 7-4. That made all the oh, difference. Damn. Oh, damn, for real? <laughs> oh, man, okay. It's all no, the same I, thing that at that time. It's a good piece of sound. The Christmas thing is good. Um, All right, Chandler, we got a little Dylan Brooks quote here for you. I shall read it. This was about leaving Memphis. The whole season was not what I wanted, but I'm happy that through all the bullshit, I was able to get what I always deserved. Hmm. Did he get too much blame? In Memphis? You know what? I'm going to roll with Dylan Brooks on this one. As a guy that got absolutely shit on in Memphis for three years, I feel him. And this, listen, this fan base, the, if you're not winning, if you're not doing exactly what they want you to do, they will turn on you. I, my first game back, I missed two free throws, and the whole entire arena was booing me from that moment forward in my first mm. season with them. So, this comes with expectations. This comes with your contract. And I do believe Dylan Brooks gave them a lot of ammo and gave that organization a lot of ammo with the silly stuff he did to, to, to say these things and to, and to kind of blame him. Now, if I'm them, I'm blaming the guy that's flashing a gun on his Instagram that ruined their entire season. That's Dylan Brooks's fault. And he did go and get paid and he did deserve that contract. And he's showing us now that he is worthy of that contract the way he's playing. But this comes with sports. I said to the media after that game, I'll treat every home game as an away game going and playing in Memphis. Is that the right thing to do? No, it's not going to make anything better. It's only going to make your life more miserable while you're there. But now he's gone and he seems to be happy and he's continued to find this role of what he's been doing lately. And he got compensated for it and he deserves it because he's having a great, great season. And the Memphis Grizzlies could really use him right now. So I feel it. I, I think that this, and this happens quite often in the league where people turn on you. Organizations, for an office, they they cover their own ass. And, and Memphis did that with me, and they did it with Dylan Brooks. Uh, just a side note, the Rockets play tomorrow against the Grizzlies. Yeah. Not in Memphis, though, right? Is it in Memphis? No, I think, or it's, is it, I think it's in Houston. Yeah, I think it's, it's in yeah, Houston. Yeah, it's in Houston. Yeah. The, the thrill um, is right, gone. Lou. Yeah, I know. It's not, it's not the same. All right, so we've got NBA's head of referee development, Monty McCutcheon, has got a quote out uh, about taunting. What we do know historically is that taunting gone unchecked leads to altercations. It leads to an increase in physicality. It leads to more, to put it kindly, passionate play. Do you agree with Monty, Lou? Yes, I agree with him. And I, I mentioned before, some guys are going to take it too far. So we got to, we kind of got to check it at the door because some guys don't know how to enjoy the passions of the game you get dunked on guys say something we're not gonna let it go we play with a lot of ego we play with a lot of pride a lot of confidence these things are gonna turn into physical altercations and so there's a gray area right there's a gray area between celebrations and there's a, there's the gray area between that and guys just purely talking trash and saying things that are disrespectful and so you don't. You can't really decipher between the two of those things when you're refereeing the game. So you got to check it. So I agree with money on this tape. It's so funny. It just. Uh, you know what it sounds like? It sounds like weed leads to hard drugs. <laughs> like that's what I hear when I hear that. <laughs> I'm like, what? what is that? Taunting. It's the, it's the new gateway drug. Yeah. So it's the gateway. I know. Yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna go too far. It's gonna, I, yeah. it's gonna no. go too far. I get it. I get so, it. Um, a, a too small. Oh, it's gonna uh, turn too, into a guy 
yeah, that's going to, this is going to turn into somebody being called a name that's, we're going to have to fight about it. Or, yeah, yeah, eventually it someone's is what just going to be so embarrassed or offended that you got the too small where you're going to push somebody and then all of a sudden it's a fight. So I definitely feel it. You get somebody on the wrong day, anything can cause a fight. Um, Donovan Mitchell had a quote. I kind of love this one. Uh, took a day off after struggling. His quote about that. I didn't touch a basketball yesterday. Kind of gave myself a mental day. Watched movies all day. Sometimes it's better to just get away. Um, I, you know, we don't know about players doing this. Chandler, is this a thing? Do you guys take like a mental day where there's just no basketball involved? Oh, yeah. First yeah. of all, I, I mean, once a week, I think you have to have an off day. So it's interesting to me if that was just his off day or did he take two off days that week? Um, but there's definitely, listen, there's, there's all, and even during season, unless you're on a skid, or unless the coach is trying to prove a point, a lot of these days are super light. A lot of these coaches even cancel shoot around day of the games. So yeah, it is really important because it's a long season, man. It is exhausting through the training camps to this, to the back-to-backs, to all the travel it's exhausting. So it is really, really important to have a day with your family, have a day to get a massage, have a day to relax because it takes a toll on you mentally and physically. What I don't understand is I'm I'm pretty sure, at least when I was playing, you get that every week. I know there, I think there, there's like a mandated rule. You have to have a certain amount of off days. So they're getting it for sure. Um, so yeah, I, I agree that again, it's a, it's a grind. So you have to be able to take that, just get away. Don't, don't even watch games. Go, go do something, go inside. Like you have to do this or you'll go crazy. Yeah, remember they called them blackout days, Chandler, when nobody could come in. Staff weren't allowed in the building. Coaching staff wasn't allowed in the building. Players aren't allowed in the building. It's called a blackout day. Everybody just take a day away. We'll come back tomorrow better than ever. I love that. Sometimes I just watch Bravo for 24 straight hours, you guys. It's called mental health. Uh, and I'm really go. big about that. Yeah, there you go. It's garbage. Uh, Tyrese Halliburton okay. recently said, I love this one, Lou. It's uh, all right. Honestly, a lot of my hoop knowledge and knowing how to play comes from video games. When you're playing 2K and you're on that camera angle where you can see everything ahead of you, that's how I think sometimes. I did not ever think about this, Lou. How much can you really learn from video games? You know what? I can't relate. I'm not a video <laughs> game guy whatsoever. I learned, I learned early on I can't play video games because I'm going to play with the team that I'm on and I'm going to shoot all the shots. Not only am I going to shoot all the shots, I'm also going to start. <laughs> so... <laughs> This this hasn't been my experience. Uh, Chandler, you got to back me up on this one. I, I don't know what's the logic on this one. Yeah, I'm not a video game guy. I've never played like with myself in 2K. I never, I, I literally play like this Super Nintendo, this poly cave machine I have where it's like this old baseball game. And I kind of feel them like you can kind of get the timing and you can kind of feel like as a video what, what you're doing. But no, I don't know. You still have to have the physical gifts and tools to be able to go out there and do it. And I never played basketball <laughs> video games. Uh, so I can't relate on this one either, unfortunately. We're too Whatever old. Whatever works for you, Tyrese. Whatever works yeah, for you. Working, it's working for him. So keep on yeah. playing. Okay. Whatever it is, it's, it's, yeah, don't change anything. Chandler, you're up next. Denny Avida uh, had this to say about fans in DC, quote, Gets me angry sometimes. Playing your city and having the whole stadium cheering, let's go Knicks. This stadium needs to chant, let's go DC. That's how it needs to be, Chandler. Um, man, does it really bother players? I guess it would when the home team crowd is pro <laughs> visiting. Yeah, it's weird. It's like if you're going to jock that team so much, <laughs> that much move to that city. Like so I, I feel them. Playing in D.C. on the Wizards, you better get used to it because there's not a lot of Wizard fans and there's going to be Laker fans, there's going to be Celtics fans, there's going to be more Knicks fans in that arena every single time they come. Um, and this 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 t this team is in such disarray right now. Doing this, like I said, I said this to the media when I was in Memphis, it's never the answer, right? This isn't going to make the fans do, if anything, it's probably going to make the fans do more of what they're doing now. So I understand it as, a, as an athlete that is supposed to give everything to this city and do all these community events and give back and spend your time off the court helping out this city. Hell yeah, it's annoying when you're in there and you're cheering for, you know, RJ Barrett when the Knicks come in town wearing <laughs> wearing LeBron jerseys. Like we're supposed to rep our city. We're supposed to rep our team. So I definitely feel them. I just never think going at a city or the fan base is a good idea when you're currently under contract, when you're retired and you're in sitting in this chair, shit on all the other cities that you played <laughs> while you're playing. Right. Don't do it.
Right. You almost can't even root against the football or the baseball team. It's like you got to be all in when you play in the city. So tread light, bro. They will get your ass out of there. <laughs> <laughs> That's and, tough. And he said something, too, where it's not like that in Europe like insinuating that like the European fan base and the Euro league is better than the NBA. So I don't like when people do that either. Like if you visit that, go back, go back, go back. I love it. Yeah. Like, World bro. wars. No, I mean, it's but good. in fairness, they're probably low. And, and, and look, Washington DC is not a place where people are born and raised necessarily generations of DC sports fans. It's people move to DC to work. So that's kind of a tough town for, for any kind of loyalty in that regard. Uh, coming up, you guys, something I know both of you love to do, a top five list of point guards when Run It Back returns. Run it back, yeah. Run it all. Run it back, yeah, yeah. Run it all. Run it back. Run it all. Run it back. So we have Tyrese Maxey and Tyrese Halliburton in, we, in action tonight. We were like, okay. Oh, hello there. Uh, we have point guards, and we're trying to figure out the list for that. So top five point guards is the list for tonight. You guys ready for this? Chandler, you're first. Yeah, this was tough. I didn't know to put Luka or not as a point guard or shooting guard or whatever, but I got Steph number one this season, every season of all time. I think Steph Curry has that. Luka, I put two. The season he's having, he's going to be at MVP talks. He's getting the Dallas Mavericks off to a great start. SGA, I went with third. He has hmm. been unbelievable. The things he's done as the centerpiece of this young, bright future team, I think he can score. He defends. I think he leads the league in steals. He does a little bit of everything. This is where I got a little tricky. It's hard to put Tyrese over Damian Lillard at this point. Damian's had some struggles this season. Obviously, career-wise, Dame is ahead of but Tyrese Maxey, from where he started and where he is now, the glow that he's had, everything he's went through from, you know, all the James Harden chatter to now having these expectations of him having to be that number one some nights, number two every night pressure, and he's handled it and blown out the expectations. I had to put him number four. And obviously the, the point guard position, wow. it's deep. It's deep. The, uh, Halliburton's having a great year. Um, there's some other really, really good point guards, but to me, this is my current top five. Current top five. All right, Lou, do you have overlaps? What's yours? Um, we got a couple overlaps. Um, for me, I got uh, Shea Gilgis Alexander. Even though it says one, it's it's Steph Curry number one for me. So I'm putting ah. I'm putting Shea at the two. Yes, I feel very much like Chandler feels. Steph Curry is going to be one, one, one until the end of time. Shea Gilgis Alexander, what he's been able to do, who he's turned into, and the position that he's put that team in, he's been blossoming. He's he's come out of the shadows as one of the top guards in the league. Luka Doncic is a walking triple-double. He's one of those guys that's always going to be in those talks. I would love to see Luka get over that hump, start having some major success, getting some big, uh, deep playoff wins. Tyrese Halliburton, since he's been traded there, he's been having a coming out party. He's put this Indiana team in a position to be talked about and to be respected. And so he goes four for me and De'Aaron De Fox goes five simply because he put out of all of these guys, with the exception of Steph Curry, he's got the Sacramento Kings to a playoff spot, made a playoff run, didn't go his way. And that team is right back in action this year. And so those are my five right now. I love this because now we get to be like, well, why not this guy? So Chandler, I'll start with you. He has De'Aaron Fox. Sacramento doing quite well. Lovely city. Uh, you don't have him. Why? Honestly, it's just such a deep position. It's crazy that neither of us have Jamal Murray either. I think no. he's, the he's the champ. He it's just, I feel like with the injuries, he's out in and out of the lineup. But again, you could go any which way here. You could put Kyrie in there the year he's having. Uh, but Fox, he's great. He's explosive. Like Lou just said, he is the sole reason why this team and this city and this organization are excited now he got them to a, a, a play a high playoff seed last year now with expectations he's young he's fun he's one of those players that is electric to watch but it's just a deep position listen john morant would be in this list if he was like playing like so this is uh, the point guard position is loaded you can go down the list from trey young's to Cade cunningham's to james arden is the star like there's so many good point guards <laughs> Someone's going to get left off. I wish we would have just done a top 10, Michelle. Oh, here we go. Here we go. But, top yeah, 10. I mean, let's, they, they all they all deserve it. And 
honestly, they're all so good. They're so talented. It's going to change weekly. Maybe next week we have someone else in there that we did this year. But to me, the crazy one is Jamal Murray. The guy's a champion. He's never been an all-star. He's probably the most underrated player ever. And he, we even just, we just did it. We just literally left him off. You our literally list. just well, did it. There, well, yeah, tell, talk. I, what it, happened? It's out of it's out of sight, out of mind. When you're not on a when you're not on the floor, it, it's hard to it's hard to remember what you got going on. And so, I, like Dame Lillard, Dame is off to a slow start, but you better believe he's gonna go on a 15, 20 game run where he's gonna be the best player on that basketball team. And so it's it's just out of sight, out of mind. You know who's not out of sight and somehow out of both y'all's minds? Jalen Brunson. What's what's the deal there? What's the deal, guys? I didn't even think. I didn't even like he. I didn't even mention him. Like yeah, he's great. It's, he's like the best player on that team. Yeah, it's it's again, it's it's a stacked position. Picture voting for the All Star game. It's again, you're gonna have to just go on what team has the best record, which is even more silly because it's gonna be the Denver Nuggets and Jamal Murray's gonna make an All Star <laughs> over these guys. <laughs> Right. I kind of love that. Is there? Are, are we missing someone? With Trey Young, we mentioned Jalen Brown, Kyrie. It is kind of crazy not have it. I'm surprised Chandler, you didn't have Luca as one. I mean, listen, I, I Steph Curry, he's the most exciting player to watch. He without that team, they're in disarray with him right now. Can you yeah. imagine that team without him and the year he's having at the age? It's just he, he's the greatest. I, again, I love Magic Johnson. <laughs> I love all these other point guards. He's the greatest of all time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not putting Luca ahead of him. All right, fair enough. I just wanted to make sure you were all right. Uh, we're taking a quick break here. When we come back, I think we have a little bit of time left for prop party. We'll get through that. We run it back with Terrence. Run it back, run it back, run it up, run it back, yeah, run it up, run it back, yeah, yeah, run it up. Why not? Why not have a prop party? Chandler, kick it off. Okay, we're doing this. We got the. <laughs> Utah Jazz to beat the Lakers tonight. I just think Are the you Lakers, sure? Le- LeBron is he's done all he can. They're, they're, I, I think I think he slows down tonight. <laughs> Jazz get this win while <gasps> Anthony Davis though has a big game and has over uh, 25. Walker Kessler's out. There's nobody. Lori Markin's gonna guard AD. Nah, give him give him a 30 ball tonight. But you have the Jazz winning. Okay, all right. I'm not gonna question it, Lou. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna stay there. I like the I like the Jazz in LA tonight. Sometimes you just scare yourself into a big game when you're in a major city, and so I like this for the Jazz tonight. And I also like the Pacers um, against the Hawks tonight in Atlanta. I like these. Lou, aren't you in Atlanta? How dare you? Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of it's kind of blasphemous, but Indiana's been a better team this year. I'm oh, not sure okay. why. <laughs> I'm not I'm not sure why they're the underdog for this game, but actually I might I might go to this game. I might go check it out. Oh, I like that. Okay, okay. I have Portland. They're they're giving them 13 points. I feel like Portland can maybe get 11. Uh, and KD over 35 because he has to. They don't have a choice. Um. That's going to do it for us today. I wanted to get to Dylan Brooks changing his name to Villain, but that's evergreen. We can do that tomorrow if we want. <laughs> Have a great Tuesday night in season tournament. Run it back, yeah, yeah. Run it up, run it back, run it up, run it back, run it up, run it back, run it up.